to be real respectful for the other poets, I'll, uh, I'm going to do something that's going to be a little quick. It's something that I'm writing. It's a longer piece. So we'll just jump into it. One, I really don't have respect for people that say, live in the moment, live in the now. It comes from a woman that came up with this psychological tool called DBT, Dialectic by Behavioral Therapy. Um, and it's sort of like cognitive behavior meets Zen and matches it together. We should always keep the past dear to us because we're starting to forget certain things that are important and it's a good recipe for disaster. The other thing that I really don't like is when people tell me you shouldn't have regrets. Fuck you. I have some regrets. And this is a story, a little bit of a story about a regret that I, I really have that haunts me. Last May in 2012 was an absolutely horrifying time. And a lot of people know uh, what happened, but a lot of people don't know. It, it was just the most horrible, horrible month uh, I've ever had in a long time. And so this month comes, this May comes along, and you know I have a lot of anxiety about it. And about a somewhere around April 13, I get a very strange email. And basically it tells me that a lover, one of my true loves, has passed away. She was 73. Um, <clears throat> and it was written by her daughter, which she might be my daughter too. Um, anyway, it started to take effect. She was one of my biggest regrets that I ever left that woman. But for somebody coming out of combat, there was just not no help for people like me. So yes, I do blame myself, but I also blame this country because there was no help. There was no help. And this woman not only saved my life, put it together, but saved my mind. Um, it was very tragic. And so here's a little piece from it. That day she came over. She wouldn't leave too long because I'd sit out in the sun, not moving and get burnt, so she'd slather me with some kind of zinc face and keep me there. But she wouldn't be away too long, knowing that I would just stay out in the sun until I got burnt to a crisp. And in Arizona, Yuma, the sun and the temperature gets around 109 as an average, and then just goes on from there. So when she came, she was carrying a little bundle I bought you some clothes, she said, and along with it, this knife. She took the knife and she dangled it and dropped it in the dirt. I leaped up and I grabbed that knife. She, I don't think she was, she was surprised that I could move that fast. And she looked at me and she goes, well, I, I guess that knife is kind of important to you. You know how to use it? And I pointed to the sign on her door and I said, one, through the knife, hit the one, and she just looked at me and she goes, I always thought that one should be an eye. I walked over to that knife, pulled it out. When I didn't move, I think she began to get frightened and started coming towards me. And then she saw the little red drops coming. I had clutched the knife by its blade and held it so tight that it was cutting into my palm and was bleeding. She said, Frank, give me the knife. Just give me the knife. She took one of the t-shirts that she bought and wrapped my hand. She says, okay, come on into the house. And there she started to sew. She was a nurse from the Vietnam era. And if you were a Vietnam nurse, well, you were just as good as any doctor that was in this country at the time. Vietnam nurses were pretty much doctors. And she looked at me and she says, why? This knife so important to you. And I looked at her and I said, because I killed a man with it and I want to remember. And at that point I started to weep. And I just remember her holding me and me weeping and 
weeping and weeping until you start heaving and heaving until there's no more tears and you're just heaving. And she led me to her bed like she always did, laid me down, and at that time she would put cream on me. But this time it was different. She ran her tongue from my neck down to my chest and onto my penis where she pulled it around and began to suck very slowly on it. But my mind was on what that night was about. Charhide had told everybody that if you had to take a shit or piss, you would stay with the union. Uh, I'll cut it off there. No, just. You'd have to stay with your unit. Instead, I disobeyed, and Charlie came through the bush and caught me by surprise. And there I was, my pants on my ground, my carbine and my 45 against a tree. And to my surprise, Charlie did something really strange. He took his gun, and instead of shooting me, put it past my neck. At that point, I leaped up, took my Bowie knife, and stuffed it into his chest. I'm going to cut it off at this point. Okay? Thank you, Frank.